Amen. I can, uh, I can be patient, you know. I can wait for uh, when, when you're ready. Rebecca, what are you doing in church? You just gave birth last week. Congratulations, by the way, yeah. So, we have been working through this series. Um, it's uh, really the life of, uh, of Gideon, and uh, I put a fancy title to it, uh, The Making of a Mighty Warrior. And uh, I'm assuming that <clears throat> that's something that you would like to be. It's a big assumption, I know, but maybe, maybe that's something that you want to be, a mighty warrior in the eyes of God. And, and we uh, have gone through a few of the steps. Um, step one was taking extreme responsibility, taking extreme responsibility for our lives. And I'm, I'm not going to summarize all of them. You can go to the previous uh, videos and so on to find, to find that. The next step was cleaning up your own backyard. If you haven't heard that message, you could just by hearing the title, you understand what it means, but uh, cleaning up your own backyard. The third was blowing a trumpet. That was last week, and uh, it was being like Gideon and uh, to begin to share with the family, with uh, neighbors, to, be, to begin to share what God had put on your heart, the way that God has led you. And, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, in Gideon's story, 32,000 people show up uh, who... Um, were uh, kind of heard the call that uh, God had given Gideon. And so here we are this morning. We're going to continue with Judges chapter 7. And I'm just going to start by reading the first verse. So Judges chapter 7, verse 1. Early in the morning, Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. And I want to just stop right there. I don't know if you underline stuff in your Bible. I don't. Uh, my wife does, incredibly. She destroys Bibles within a few years. But anyways, uh, this line right here, all his men. So it's not just Gideon. It's him and all of his men now. And uh, you understand that... You, you're, uh, you know, Gideon here at the beginning of the story is he's, he started already to work with the willing few. It's funny for me to say the willing few because there's like 32,000 people that showed up. But hold on, we're not done with, uh, with the story. So he begins to work with the willing few. If you want to do something for God, do it with others. Do it with other people. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And there's very good, um, uh, many examples of this in Scripture. Moses had a team of 70 elders. Elijah had a school of prophets. David had his mighty men. You can find those stories um, in the book of Samuel and Chronicles. But he had his mighty men. And Jesus chose the 12 disciples. The Apostle Paul. There's all kinds of people. And you can find them all over. Uh, almost every letter he writes has a list of names. You look at um, Romans, uh, the, the last chapter. On, I mean, the whole chapter is dedicated to a list of names. Um, he worked with Luke, Timothy, Barnabas. Silas, Mark, Demas. If you look closer, and I know we're digging deep right here at the beginning of the sermon, but uh, this is, bear with me, this is leading somewhere. It says, it says at, at, if you look at the Apostle Paul's ministry really closely, you'll see that at the beginning of his ministry, he was willing to give up John Mark for the sake of his calling. And if you know the story, and you can look at it in the book of Acts, you'll see that there's this instance where he takes this John Mark with him, and then halfway through the trip, John Mark gives up and leaves. And so the next time, John Mark says, oh, can I go on the next missionary trip with you? And, and the apostle Paul says, no. He says, I'm not taking you. You were, you're a shirker. You know, you're, <laughs> you gave up last time. Sorry. You know, and so at the beginning, this is really at the beginning of his ministry. He's willing to give up John Mark for the sake of his calling. 
uh, near the end of his ministry, it's the opposite. We see that he's willing to give up a good opportunity in ministry for the sake of people. Look at this. This is interesting. Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, a man of experience. Now, he spent his whole life doing this. He understood where the door of opportunity was. He saw what God was doing. He said, oh, I need to be a part of that. You know, he saw an open door. That the Lord had opened a door for me. What does he do? I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. And so, I said goodbye to that great opportunity of ministry. I said goodbye to that wonderful open door. And... Um, he went on to Macedonia. I'm, I'm supposing that he was looking, uh, uh, that, that Titus was, was there. Uh, but this kind of thing shows us that perhaps uh, the true calling is the people that we're working with. The true calling of God is the people that we're working with and not necessarily what it is that we're doing. Ministry is not the job of a superhero but the work of teams. A pastor, I know, used to say there are no super grapes. There are no super grapes. The only thing special about us is that we are all connected to the same true vine as Jesus once called himself. No super grapes. And so, in groups and teams, not only is work done better and faster, but a community is developed at the same time. That community or body is the church. Are you with me? That's my theology right there. My, my theology of working in teams, and it's not only for me, so the quality of a leader is determined by how I treat those who work with me. That also applies for you. You know, that, that you need to work like Gideon with people. And the people are the real call of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two people can accomplish more than twice as much as one. They get a better return for their labor. More than twice as much as one. That means that one plus one equals three. Thank you, Solomon. One plus one equals three. Speaking of numbers, I was saying early on that Gideon, you know, makes this announcement uh, all over the country, and 32,000 people show up to join him in his work. And then, this is where we are right now, okay, 32,000 people. Then God tells him something that no leader no pastor wants to hear. Are you ready for this? Michael, are you ready for this? Yeah. Verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. It's too many. It's just, you know, there's just, what are you thinking? Like 32,000, it's too many. I cannot deliver Midian into, into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. And so, 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. And I just put a parenthesis in here, okay, that, like, kudos to these, these people, 22,000, who came, even though they were afraid, but they came anyways. They were afraid, <laughs> but they showed up. Anyway, so we wanna, we're not going to look bad at these people who left, okay, because they, they came. They came and they were afraid, but let's that's, that's continue. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. Well, thank you, Lord. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. You have too many men. 
is the theme of this <laughs> of where we're going here. And from this time on, in all of these verses, Gideon is doing things, I guess it's, you could call it his discipleship process, okay? This is discipleship process to discourage people so that they go home rather than motivate them to fight with him. Like, what is going on, Gideon? Like, why are you doing this? First of all, he's doing, and we see it in, in, in the whole story, he's doing exactly what God asked him to do. Okay, that's number one. He's doing what God asked him to do. The next is, he's setting the bar really high. You know that expression, to set the bar high? If you want to be a doctor or an athlete, you will go to places which will help you set the bar high so that you can uh, compete and succeed at a higher level. That's what it means to set the bar high. Um, why is it that because it's a church, we think that the bar should be set low? Part of the problem is that the churches, um, that churches often measure success based on attendance. Well, that's one of the ways we, uh, we measure our success. Um, I mean, it is encouraging. Isn't it encouraging when more people come to the service? I mean, right? It, it's better than being empty, right? So uh, it, it's kind of encouraging when there's more people that come. I, I mean, I can't imagine me saying, oh, I'm sorry, uh, there's a few too many people in church. We're going to have to ask you to leave. Or maybe we'll have someone at the door, you know, uh, counting. And, and uh, when we get to a certain number, okay, that's enough. Uh, you know, we have enough people. Uh, maybe you come back next week. Uh, you know, we're just at the, the maximum that we can, you know. That's generally not what we do. We'll do everything. We'll, we'll, we'll make the, big build, the, the, bigger, the building bigger. We'll do everything we can. But we generally uh, do things to increase, not decrease, our attendance. So the question is this. Is attendance the right way to measure our success as a church? It's a hard question, I know. Look, you got yourself right behind the post, right? So. Is it the right way to measure success as a church? And this is something that we all have to think about. Um, I'm afraid that over the years, our efforts, in our efforts to encourage more people to come to church, we have set the bar too low. We've set the bar a little bit too low. And of course, I could give you examples of that, but I don't know. It's a little personal. It gets a little personal sometimes. So I'm just going to skip that. And I'm going to take you to an example of what happened in the ministry of Jesus. Now, one day, when Jesus was at the height of his popularity, and yes, Jesus uh, was very popular there for a period. And there's this crowd of people, we'll call them groupies, okay, that were just following him around everywhere, just wouldn't let him go. And after a while, um, Jesus decides to say something about it. Uh, you'll remember uh, it was in this period where Jesus does a miracle and feeds 5,000, you know, and I, I guess some of those people were part of that. And, and so Jesus turns to them and says that they're just following him because of the food he was giving them. Pretty direct, pretty hard, right? But, but that's not the end. He, he proceeds to explain to them that if they wanted to continue to follow him, that they would have to take part in his suffering. The words he used were even hard to understand, saying things like, they should eat my flesh and drink my blood. And so, when they told Jesus that this was really hard to understand, like, how do you expect us to, to continue following you like this? You know, this is, like, I'm not sure I even understand what you're, what you're saying. Jesus kept hammering away at it, and you need to look. At, it's in John chapter 6, okay? You need to, it's a long chapter. We don't have time to read the whole thing right now, okay? That's why I kind of gave you a summary. 
But look what happens in verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you want to leave me too? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Now, you need to analyze and look carefully at what Peter is saying here. He says, yes, what you had to say there was really difficult and really hard, and we, we really need to think twice about what we're doing here. But listen, where else are we going to go? You have the words of prosperity You have the words of healing. You have the words of success. Is that what they said? Is that what Peter said? It's not what he said. I'm, I'm playing with you, right? It's not, he didn't say any of these. He says, actually, if Jesus had said those words, prosperity, healing, success, all of those people would have continued following him. It's precisely the fact that he wasn't talking about those things that they left him. No, you have the words of eternal life and holiness. That's what he's talking about. First of all, Jesus has the words. You have the words. Jesus has the words, not me. I, I get worried sometimes I hear a lot of people using these words like declaring, proclaiming. I don't have the words. I, can't. I mean, sure, the things that I say can have an impact. If I tell my son that he's stupid all the time, that's going to have an impact on him. Like, I understand that, but this is not what we're talking about. I cannot call into being things that were not. Romans chapter 4. If you look carefully at Romans chapter, you don't even need to look carefully. You just need to read it. It's God that does that. It's God that calls into being things that were not. It's His words, not mine. And the focus of what God says and does is so much greater, so much greater than what we see and what we want Today, it's not about material things. It's about eternal things. It's not about the flesh. It's about the spirit. The focus is not success, but holiness. There's the words of Jesus. So this leads us to the same question, whether the story of Gideon or the story of Jesus. The hard question would you still be sold out for the cause of Jesus if there was no promise or guarantee of prosperity, physical healing, or success in this life? Would you be sold out to that Jesus? Because I promise you, the true gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't promise any of these things in this life. I would be lying if I told you otherwise. It doesn't promise those things. The gospel promises much greater and much higher things than these. And so we need to raise the bar a little higher. Raise the bar a little higher. We need to learn. We need to know. We need to study. We need to build faithfulness. We need to practice sacrificial giving. We need to see the church not as a place of celebration, but a place of preparation. So, how do we raise the bar? Let's go back to our story, the story of Gideon, and we continue reading at verse 5. Are you nervous? 
What is he going to say next? <laughs> What's going to happen next, right? So verse, verse 5. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel and drink and, and kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. The rest got down on their knees to drink. I, I, I don't know if you can picture this. It's pretty simple. I, I'm supposing that one of them, they were just kind of like on one knee and they were kind of lap like this, right? And the other ones, well, they had, I'm not going to do it, okay? So they got all the way down uh, on both knees and, and were drinking the water, uh, uh, you know, with their lips to the water, right? So that, that's, that's the image there of, of this. And it says that 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took uh, over the provisions and trumpets of the others. So 300 of them drank from cupped hands. 300, that's out of 10,000 that were there, that's 300, that's 3%. 3%. Who wants to be part of the 3% this morning? 3%, 3%. Who wants 3%? Yeah, about that. About, well, maybe we got 10% here. But, uh, yeah, 3%. What is it that differentiated the 3% from the rest? Now, I've looked this up, and, and, and different commentators have said different things. Um, here's a few of them. One group drinks in a vulnerable position, while the others are in a position of readiness. And so the chosen are ready. If you're ready, God's going to do something amazing in your life kind of thing, right? Okay. There's another one that says that they, these people are tested by how they refresh themselves. And so the chosen are those who are able to refresh themselves in their personal lives, without being distracted from God's purposes for their lives. Okay, if, you, if you're not distracted by, by the way that you refresh yourself, then God's going to do something amazing in your life. Okay, so maybe that one. Here's the third. The chosen were people who drank differently. They just drank differently, you know. So people who think differently can see from God's perspective. And if you can see things differently uh, according to God's perspective, then God will do something amazing in your life, okay? So one of, one of those, I, I suppose, we need to choose. But maybe it's none of those. Maybe all of these things are kind of missing the point. We said earlier that God didn't want His people to think, whoa, I'm special. Look at us, eh? Look what we did. We... we conquered all these people. God didn't want them to think that there was something special about them because he wanted to get the glory for it. So maybe we're missing the whole point here. Let's just say for now that for whatever reason, God chose them. What's more important, I think, is what happens next. Now, these 300 have to face an army of 135,000 men. I think that's more significant, okay? So here you got 300 people that have to, pay, to face um, 135,000 men. I, I'm thinking that faced with such impossible odds, I think I would be forgetting about the drink of water that I had earlier <laughs> or how it is that God chose or what was that? Impossible odds. Is the main theme here. Odds. A calculation of probability. It's math. In our lives, often we do math. We calculate things. We're, we calculate uh, if we're going to be able to do this or not. 
um, if everything is going to be okay or not. That's why we make a budget, right? We make a budget, we plan for the future in our education, our job perspectives. We look for ways to give ourselves confidence in the choices that we're making. And by the way, all this is normal. We should be doing that, right? If you're a mature person, you should be looking forward. You should be making plans. You should, uh, that's, uh, that's a normal thing. But if we had our way, I think that everything would be planned and secured. <laughs> the, the odds would always be 100% in our favor. Of course. The odds would always be 100% in our favor. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't plan, but how... In this system of thinking, do we learn to have faith and confidence in what God wants to do in our lives? How, the what tool can God use to teach us and to train us to raise the bar, right? So that we can have trust and confidence in what He's doing in our lives. One answer, impossible odds. Impossible odds. <laughs> you want an example? Uh, there's so many of them. Elijah. Elijah that uh, went against 450 prophets of Baal. I don't know if he knew at the beginning of the story that there were actually 450 prophets of Baal. I don't know that. I think he got up one day and realized, whoa, there's that many of them? <laughs> 450 prophets, eh? But we learn from that story. God is on Elijah's side. And if God is on his side, who can stand against him? Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego. Ever heard of that story? Actually, the story, the story is so, so clear and direct on this subject that I'm just going to read what they say. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. I'm reading, okay? This is what it says. He will save us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, look at the theology there. Even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. We don't need to look far, actually. We don't need to look far in the Bible. We don't need to look far in our own lives. When it comes to how God works with people, God uses impossible odds. Impossible odds. God uses sickness. God uses disaster, persecution, bankruptcy, failure, pain, and every other evil that you can think of. God uses impossible odds. And when we are faced with impossible odds, God's megaphone is pointed directly into our ears. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you have confidence in what I'm about to do in your life? So is God raising the bar in your life? Is God raising the bar? Because when we have learned to face impossible odds, in our lives. That's the first step. But if you want to be a mighty warrior, this is where it goes. This is where it goes. Now, now you're facing impossible odds for other people. You see other people, this because this is what the people are doing, right? These 300 men, they're standing in the gap. They are uh, facing impossible odds for the people of Israel, for the whole country. You want to be a mighty warrior, not only do you need to get used to facing impossible odds in your own personal life. But now you have to do it for other people. Facing impossible odds. 
is when real people take simple steps that demonstrate that their full trust and confidence is in God. Now, some of you are still stuck at um, knowing whether you're part of the 3% or not. And, and like, how do I know if I'm it? Like, if, has, God, has God really called me? Has God, does, does God really want to use me? Is God going to be with me if I go forward? And Am I part of the chosen? How do I know that I'm really chosen? I have a few questions that you can ask yourself. Well, a few, two questions that you're going to ask yourself. The first is, are you in love with Jesus? Are you, are you in love with the people of God? Are the people of God important to you? That's number one. Number two, are you facing impossible odds in your life? Are you facing impossible odds? You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> are you facing impossible odds? You're the only one in your family. No one else wants to serve the Lord like I do. I'm all by myself. I'm the only one at work that wants to, to work with integrity, to be honest, to do things right. I'm the only one at school, at university, who stands up when the lady or the man up front says something that just doesn't make sense. Are you facing impossible odds? Guess what? You are chosen. You're part of the 3%. That's it. That's it. That's all. And you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a second. Um, okay, so what about how does this sermon going to end? Like, aren't you going to talk about the victories and the, and the you know, that stuff? Uh, well, it's coming. Okay, we're not there yet. But actually, I don't know if you caught it, but God already promised all kinds of things. If we look back, I'm trying to find here in my notes, where was it? Yeah. When, uh, you know, the 300 men that, he, that, that God said he would keep. Yeah, I'm keep those 300 men. I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. He already promised it. It was almost like a, in parentheses. Oh, by the way, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to take care of it. I will save you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Already said that. Already been there. I will go before you and I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's how many times has it been said? Isaiah 45. Really great. I will go before you and behind you and beneath you and beside you and all around you. I will be with you. Jesus says that I will be with you till the end of the age. It's already been said. The question is not what God will do. The question is how we will have confidence in what he is doing. Yeah, I'm about done. Let's stand together. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, you're facing impossible odds. You're part of the 3%. You can put up your hand. Impossible odds. Lord, we face those impossible odds. We don't cower away. We don't blame it on the devil. We say, Lord, what will you have from me? What do you want me to do? What's the next step, Lord? Lord, I have confidence in what you're doing. Lord, make me into your warrior. Lord, you are good. You are faithful. You are all-powerful. But these impossible odds that I'm facing 
I choose to see them as you speaking to me. I will have confidence in what you're doing. Whether there's a victory or not, I have confidence in what you're doing. Whether there is success, whether there is financial freedom or not, I have confidence in what you're doing. Jesus, Jesus, send the Republican. Jesus, Lord, teach us. Teach us, Lord. Jesus, send the Republican. Jesus. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does this. The, only I can, I can repeat the words of the story. I can repeat scripture to you. But now the Holy Spirit needs to speak to you and give you that courage to face impossible odds in your life and to see it as God speaking to you. Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the work that you're doing in these amazing people. Lord, we thank you. I pray that you would continue to bless and provide and lead and guide, we pray, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.